Hey everyone, Rick Albert here. Today we're going to be interviewing a good friend, brother-in-law, and repeat client, Mike Wiley. So Mike, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and what you do in the real world? In the real world, I am the Director of Cybersecurity Services for Richie Mate Technology Solutions. So from a day-to-day -day perspective, I keep the cyber space safe. Nice. Yeah, one of the, things I, one of the reasons I want to have this conversation is now that in LA, just about everyone's working from home. And when we're at work, we have certain security measures in place, but we don't necessarily have that when you're in your own home. So we, I want to talk about what people can do. So I guess if we'll just get right into it. So because of the quarantine, what are some of the precautions that people need to take and, you know, that they normally would have at their office, but they need to take at home? So I guess there's two different perspectives. There's the employer perspective and also the employee, which I think everyone's responsible for, for security. But the two things that come to mind and things that we've coached our clients on through this transition where essentially the entire world has gone into, I would say quarantine, but they have tested their business continuity plan, plans and disaster recovery plans almost overnight. And the first thing is uh, physical security. So the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, I read an article the other day that said crime has already increased and they expect that to keep happening. Um, that was a little bit contradictory what I originally thought because I thought, well, we're all at home, so there's going to be no home robberies in the middle of the day like we, we typically see in Los Angeles. Um, but I, I believe, obviously, people are concerned with um, finances. You know, anytime there's uncertainty, crime goes up. And so uh, physical security of the of uh, office space. So if we're all working from home and bad guys know that the office buildings are unoccupied and that's where you've got servers and, you know, expensive equipment and probably still a lot of monitors and there's no one that's going to be there. That's a prime opportunity, not just at night, but all through the day where people can go and break in and steal things, whether it's like I said, monitors, servers, hard drives, those kind of things. And it also brings up another concern that um, in California, we've got the breach database where if you have 500 records or more, that are lost, stolen. It could be just, let's say you've got 500 customers that, or that you've sold um, properties to and you have record of those in your email and that's sitting on a hard drive or a thumb drive in your office and that's stolen. In California, you need to report that um, and you're basically on a naughty list in a database where it says what happened, that you lost those records of your customers, you have to send out notices, uh, credit monitoring to those people. And then also earlier this year, uh, the, Cal the California Consumer Privacy Act, CCPA, went into effect. And so that also has monetary damages that uh, companies have to pay if they violate um, certain laws or regulations. And then also if they're just negligent with protecting consumer data. So um, those are two things that, that especially if you've got hard drives laying around, backup drives that aren't encrypted, that those could be stolen and not just the physical cost of that uh, being a harm to the company, but then also the, the regulations and the reporting and other things that you have to get involved as well. Um, I'd say the second piece is remote access. So a lot of companies weren't set up for that. They don't have a remote access policy. They, they don't have procedures on best practice for remote access. And so all of a sudden people are doing whatever they can to get their work done and keep their jobs, but they didn't think that through and they had a couple of days or sometimes overnight to prepare for this. And so they open up insecure ports, they allow remote access from anywhere in the world, and the bad guys are taking advantage of that. I mean, we can see that there's ransomware attacks that are going on, all kinds of exploits that are happening in the wild. So the bad guys are taking advantage of this. Um, I did read one article that some of them are being nice enough and they're not good to attack hospitals during this period, oh, but the rest of us are still fair game. So um, the remote access uh, without things like uh, CASB or Shadow IT, where the company can still try and protect some of the data where people are working from home. Um, another concern is Wi-Fi. So we went from a typical organization, you have maybe one location, two locations, so on. And the IT department, security people, they know that network. They know the, the ins and the outs of it. They understand how to troubleshoot it. Well, all of a sudden you have, if you've got 500 employees, you now have to manage 500 networks. And everyone has their own configuration, their own routers, their own speed. So that's a challenge. And a lot of times home Wi-Fi is not very secure. You're probably on the same network as your kids playing Xbox or your kid's computer, which um, they're downloading all kinds of things off the internet. 
Um, it's, it's basically one big network and anything that's traversing the wireless signal uh, could potentially be intercepted by someone who maybe hacked your kid's Xbox or sitting in a van outside or whatever it is. If you've got open wireless network, um, a lot of times those are reported on certain websites where anyone has access to it and they, they post it that this person in this location has wireless that's not encrypted and it's open for the public. So the whole world knows that, that basically they can join your network and sniff your traffic and see what you're doing online. So those are probably the three that I, I'd be most concerned about from, from a company and things that employees may want to think about before they just open up their work laptop, connect to their home Wi-Fi, and continue working. Okay, so kind of going off of that, is there anything at this point, since everybody's out of their office, yep. it's essentially the office now fair game, or is there anything companies can do now to at least try to protect what's there? So they could absolutely, I think I, IT departments right now are still overwhelmed, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. going from one network to now supporting 100 or 300 networks. And I can only imagine the calls that, that some of these people are getting in the middle of the night, like Zoom's not working or Teams isn't working or Slack. And then they have to figure out, well, is it the application? Is it the person's just slow internet speed? Whatever it is. So um, I think it's going to be a little while before a lot of people have the, the capacity to do some of these things. Um, so we just went right into work from home. Um, but as soon as that, those resources open up, or if the company is able to outsource that to someone like Richie May Technology Solutions, where we come in and kind of help with some of these things, but absolutely things like uh, setting up a, a VPN connection. So the, the employee working from home, all of their data is now encrypted going back to the office. Um, you know, sending out educational material like uh, security awareness training more than ever. This is the time to remind employees, hey, keep strong passwords. Um, don't let people use your work computer. Um, you know, it may be very tempting when you're working from home and your kid sees a laptop. Oh, can I go surf something or can I look this video up on YouTube? You know, you need to remind the employees that this is not the, the time to do those things and reinforce those security best practices early on in this work from home experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, as far as the physical security, uh, obviously, if, if you still have access to the office, so I would go in there and make sure things are locked down. I, I saw some liquor stores were boarding up their windows, preparing for, for a riot, but maybe not go that far, but make sure that uh, hard drives have full disk encryption. There's endpoint protection like uh, EDR antivirus on laptops that you're handing out to employees. So yes, we're already in this situation and probably a lot of those best practices weren't done. But as soon as we have the, the time or the resources or we can outsource those tasks to someone else, um, a lot of companies and people need to start thinking about those things as quickly as possible. Because I, I get the feeling we're going to have a big influx in um, breaches and stuff like that because someone's home computer was compromised and it didn't have proper updates or antivirus. Okay. So uh, from the office perspective, there might be something you can do as long as you have access. So yeah. let's say you don't and now you're stuck at home, what can someone who's computer illiterate such as myself do yeah. to, well, to protect yourself? So a lot of it's gonna have to be come down from, from the company themselves, right? Okay. So it, it's a little bit different if you are, let's say a real estate agent and you are control of your own computer, you're maybe you own your own computer, definitely there's a lot of things you can do. But in, in an organization where um, these things come from IT, it's a little hard and, and I probably, I'd be concerned to recommend that you go out and buy your own antivirus or endpoint detection tools or encrypt your own laptop. That's probably going to cause a bigger mess than, than good. Um, so I, I think it really depends on the, the type of company and where things are coming from. But the most you could do as a, an employee is just go back to those, the security awareness and think about the best practices and really just listen to whatever IT or security is telling you. So if they say use a VPN, do that. If they say, you know, don't lend your computer to any family members or guests, make sure you follow those rules. If they say lock your computer when you step away from it, all those things that you were taught and those best practices, think about those and go the extra mile. When you look at an email, um, double, double check it, look at the sender, look at the, the attachment, look at all those things we talked about with phishing or malware that comes in through email, take the extra second, especially uh, in these times and think about those things of, should I click this? Should I put in my password here? Um, that's probably the best thing that most of us can do who are, are not getting those things from IT or security at the moment. Um, and I'm sure those things will come like better antivirus and updates and stuff like that. But a lot of that's gonna be on the company side. 
Right. Okay. So since you touched on emails, I feel like emails is such a vulnerable spot, especially like in real estate, when we send out offers, we have pre-approval letters, sometimes with a buyer and they have a mortgage guy. So they're sending information that way. Sure. What can we do from an email perspective to just add our own layer of you know, protection? Yeah. So uh, there's, there's a couple of things on the company side, uh, Richie made technology solutions. I, I actually managed the, uh, we launched a COVID-19 um, indicator of compromise tracker. So basically everything that, that we see in our clients is monitoring their security. If we see an email, a URL, a domain name, a, a file name, whatever we see related to a scam, um, specifically related, related to coronavirus or COVID-19, we're tracking that. So we actually keep a database on our blog that's updated in real time with all the different um, senders. So um, you as a, an employee probably wouldn't go there and check every email you get against our database, but companies mm -hmm. can use that and implement them as block lists. So they don't, their employees don't get hit with that. On the, um, on the employee side, so like yourself, some things that you can do is um, the, pretty much the, the usual. You can take a look when you get these emails. Um, be very cautious of any attachments that you get. That's the number one way that malware is introduced into an environment. So, um, you know, is this, is this attachment really something I would expect? Is this something I should click on? So think twice about that. Looking at the where things are from. Anything that's outside the organization, immediately it's a little bit more skeptical of is this something I should be looking at more than just reading the text in the email? Um, is there anything that stands out as far as spelling and grammar mistakes? Um, are there logos that don't make sense? Are there anything in the email that, is, uh, that has urgency or is asking me to act on something like click this link? Um, you know, we're running out of, let's say, face masks, order now, those kind of things that are, are giving kind of like an urgency. Um, those are, are typically tactics that the bad guys use when they're, they're setting up email campaigns. And um, there's millions of malicious emails sent every day. So uh, as you mentioned, that's something to focus on and just take your time, double check, when in doubt, send those emails to IT or security and have them look at it. But you don't want to be clicking on it and then after the fact say, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, I remember, I think because you guys work with our company and a couple of years ago on our development side, an email went through trying to approve a huge purchase. Yeah. And instead of it saying, I think it was supposed to be the letter I in the email, someone changed it to a capital L. So yes. if you didn't pay attention, you would have thought that actually did come from your coworker. Yep. And you, um, they almost approved, I think it was like a 10 or $20,000 purchase. But luckily in our system, we're like, that's not normal. That doesn't look right. And that's when we figured it out real fast. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the more sophisticated ones that, that I've seen where they tried to clone your domain name, replace mm -hmm. one letter, and it looked like they actually compromised uh, possibly a vendor of yours, and they were looking at emails going back and forth because they had your signatures from multiple mm -hmm. people in the company. They knew who was approving invoices. Um, you know, we did a full investigation, and there was no compromise on your side, um, but I'm, I'm guessing one of the vendors you work with or one of your customers, someone else was compromised, saw that. And they were trying to uh, basically pull money out of that. But you guys had a lot of things done right, good security, so you weren't breached. Um, someone reported that email, so they did a great job with their security training and knowing how to report that. And then you also had internal procedures, um, which I won't go into detail on, but uh, that mitigated that as well. So it wasn't just that anyone could request money and it got pushed through accounting. There was a lot of procedures in place to prevent something like that. So all those things went a long way and that's, that's evidence that something like that works, but the, the tricks and the tactics the bad guys are using, they're getting more sophisticated. They're, they're preying on anyone they can. Um, uh, during uh, the research we did for our COVID-19 indicator database, uh, we were seeing about 1900 domain names registered with the name COVID or Corona uh, per day. So people, mm -hmm. some of those might be legitimate sites, but uh, I'm feeling a lot of those are going to be fake maps. Um, they're going to be scam messages. They're going to be used for phishing. So a lot of stuff coming out. The bad guys are always looking for new, uh, new ways to, to get into your environment. Do you notice, because I, I guess there's two ways. Like one, if I'm a hacker, I can either go for the big fish, the big companies, because if I can get them once, I get a huge chunk of money, or am I better off going with the smaller fish, like the smaller companies? Yes, you have to go through more of them, but because their security isn't as 
sophisticated, I have a higher probability of success. Like, what are yeah. you seeing on that end? I would see a mix. So there's, there's two different, um, two different avenues that you've got, um, some of them that are just mass distributed. So it's, it's malware or phishing campaigns and they'll basically send it to anyone they can. Mm-hmm. And in those cases, it doesn't really matter, right? They, they find a vulnerability or something that's wrong with Microsoft or Adobe or some type of product and Microsoft announces the patch. The moment that those, those updates come out from Microsoft or Adobe or whoever, um, attackers go to town and they say, well, we assume that a lot of people aren't updating right away. So we're going to go ahead and build malware that takes advantage of that vulnerability. And so a majority of people, you can look at some graphs, but, but it's, it's pretty consistent that when the patch comes out, you know, some people update, but it takes a while for everyone to get that updated. So from that time it's released to the time that 99% of us have it, they've got that window of opportunity to, to exploit or make their malware work. And so there's a, a basically a diminishing return on their malware essentially. And um, so they'll do that mass. They'll spread it to as many people as they can, um, but it's, it's pretty short lived. Then um, the targeted stuff, they tend to go for people that are a little bit weaker in security, but also have a need for their data or that can, that it's a big deal if they lose it. Right. And so if you can easily work from home, if you can easily recreate your data, it, they, that's not really a target for them. They're interested in the companies that um, have maybe like hospitals, right? So if you can't work with your computers um, because you need patient records, you need to send requests, emails, that kind of stuff, they know that the hospitals are going to pay money, right? Or the city, for example, um, they're going after a lot of cities because they know the city has a lot of money and they need that for police reports. But they always claim that, that they don't. And that's why they keep everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what they say, but apparently they do. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So it, it just depends. We see both. We see some very interesting, sophisticated, where they, they attack hospital networks and they know they can get a lot of money out of that. But then mm-hmm. we also see some other stuff that's just, you know, every every one of our clients gets the same email. It's just mass produced. Got it. Okay. So what? If, okay. So now let's talk about like a combination of both. Meaning, if I'm a buyer or seller and I'm communicating with an escrow office that might be a huge office or a mortgage, you know, lender what precautions should really both sides be taking knowing that emails can be easily compromised people are exchanging time i mean i remember when i was applying for loans you know they asked for my driver's license three times yeah like three different ways so what can people do while they're under contract because even today you can still complete a purchase or complete a sale sure so one thing i think both sides can do um Generally, a, a well-established company, especially lender-wise, um, you know, there's certain regulations out there like um, FFIEC, if you follow those frameworks, um, the big lenders have to, to adhere to that. And when they do that, one of those things is that you have to educate your customers about cybersecurity. So you, you have to be a certain, hit a certain threshold to need to comply with that. But I think everyone should as far as the, the loan officers, real estate agents, escrow companies, title, all that, as far as educating their, um, their customers, but then also on top of that, um, enforce best practices, right? And I know it's difficult when you've got a consumer who's 70 years old and they might say, well, I don't know how to use this portal that you set up. And so it may be tempting to bypass and say, all right, just text it to me or email it to me or whatever it is. But having, enforcing that, say, and educate the, the consumers, like I'm doing this for your best interest. And here's why, and maybe come up with a scenario about some, how someone lost their life savings and, and because they didn't follow best practices. And that's why we do these things to protect you. Um, I, I think way too often we see, and I've been experienced that with a real estate agent and a lender that uh, requested Not us. email. What's that? <laughs> Was it from us? No, no, no. They, someone <laughs> yeah, else I they didn't requested. Think so. they, <laughs> you, guys, you guys are good with your security, but... <laughs> Um, they requested that stuff and they asked, Hey, could you send over a tax return? And it's like a Yahoo account. And those type of things are then encouraging or making it okay for consumers to do those type of things, right? When the consumer might not know in a lot of situations that sending a tax return or a W2 or some confidential information to a Yahoo account that has no security on it and not just picking on Yahoo, Gmail doesn't matter, but a personal type of account 
is not good. That person can get easily hacked. There's no enforcement for security, right? There's no IT or security person looking at that stuff. But the more that businesses make those things available to the consumer, not force them to use best practices, the more consumers think, well, that's okay. I, that's fine if someone calls me that. And I know um, I, I'm going to name them, but Barclay Bank. Um, I have a customer of them and they have called me and said, we think there's fraud on your account on numerous occasions. And they said, please verify the last four of your social or your mother's maiden name. And I said, absolutely not. You just called me. You can verify who you are and give me some information on my account that only Barclay would know. And then I will answer your question. They say, well, we can't do that till you verify your identity. Sorry, then I'm not going to do business with you or we're not going to, you know, figure this out. But, um, and they'll say, okay, well, you can, you can call me back on this number. Another big no-no, right? Because I could easily call you and say, hi, I'm from you know, Bank of America. Please uh, verify your social. And you say, no, I'm smarter than this. I, I watched this webinar with Rick and Mike. I'm not going to do that. But, um, but and then I say, well, call me back on this number, 818, blah, blah, blah. And then you call back. That's my phone number. It doesn't really prove anything about identity. So mm -hmm. if those situations happen, the consumer needs to go ahead and look at the website for, for Barclay or Bank of America, whoever they're working with, look at that phone number or go back to prior correspondence and use that phone number. But if someone calls you, they have no, there's no way to validate them unless they give that information. So I think that's a big no-no for banks and lenders and whoever. And I've seen not just the big banks do it, but also smaller companies will call me and say, this is so-and-so from escrow or so-and-so from um, even a, uh, a notary. And the notary called and said, I, you know, I want to come to your, your house. What's your address? So, Sorry, I'm not going to give you my address. You called me. I said, what's the loan number? What's the escrow number? What's this? I, I don't know. It's not in front of me. Then call me back when you know that information. But, you know, doing those things by, by asking, it, it seems uh, harmless, but that opens up the door where then that's acceptable and okay for anyone to call and ask for your address, for your social, those kind of things. It's not good practice. So both sides, consumers need to stick their ground say, I'm not going to give out inf information unless you validate yourself. And then the, the, on the other side, the companies need to practice those best practices and enforce that with their employees and not just call or ask for things in insecure channels. Yeah. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Yahoo, Gmail, all of those, they're off the hook when it comes to security. It's not like if your email gets breached, you can go to Gmail saying, well, you should have done a better job protecting me. For the most part, I mean, we're, we're still seeing what happened with the big Yahoo breach. Um, mm -hmm. I got an email about a month ago that said they're still working on a settlement for, you know, multi-million, multi-billion dollar settlement for the breach that they had. It seems like almost a decade ago. Um, so they're still working that piece out. But so for the most part, no, right? And, and mm -hmm. especially it puts a lot of people in liability. You're, you're basically being negligent by using those, those free personal accounts and not having security. There's no encryption. Um, what happens then? as a, let's even say, I'm going to pick on you or, you know, as a real estate agent, let's Go for say it. That, <laughs> that someone, I was getting a loan and I sent you my tax return. Uh, I don't know why I'd be sending it to you, but even if I did, what's the next step? Maybe you were being nice enough and saying, I'll pass this on to your, your loan officer, but what's the next thing you do? You might forward it, which is now it's in your inbox and in your sent box, or you might upload it to the portal on their behalf, which means you have to download that document. It's now sitting on your maybe personal desktop or downloads folder, you're basically just spreading that information all over the place in insecure channels. So um, in, those, in, in those situations, I think it's, it's important just to think about, you've got to have the company-wide email that's got a paid email gateway. So it's looking for those bad emails. You've got encryption. None of those, those free email accounts have full end-to-end -end encryption. They try and use encryption, but the way most email works is that it attempts to use encryption. If the other party does not accept encryption, then it sends it in plain text over the, over the internet. And it never tells you either way. It's just yeah. the best, best effort to encrypt. If not, sorry, we tried. Yeah. I, well, I know when I send out offers and we have to include proof of funds, I always make sure the account numbers are crossed out. Yeah. You know, even if I've had clients send it to me and they didn't. So I actually, sometimes I'll print it out, cross out their account numbers, and then rescan it just to make sure you can't see it. And then I send out the offer because the other side doesn't care. They don't need yeah. that information. They just need to see the number and that the name matches. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those kind of things that most people don't think about, right? They're probably just yeah. receiving that on their, okay. their Yahoo account and then forwarding that off, which, you know, for as long as they have that account, it's probable that your, your data is in there. I mean, how often do most people go into their sent box 
and delete out things that they sent. Right. So in the yeah, meantime, totally your good. tax return, your bank account numbers, all that stuff is sitting in some real estate agent's sent box. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay. So uh, what should, so if let's say someone's watching this, they're freaking out and they start interviewing IT companies, what questions should they be asking to know that they're actually decent? You know, that's a good question. So I was interviewed by uh, another publication on how to pick a security provider, but I haven't mm -hmm. done any articles or interviews as far as IT providers. Um, I think it, it's, it's one of those things, just like any industry of, of asking as many questions and getting educated. If you know someone who's in the industry who can also help interview or give you some questions, um, I, I think it's, it's very similar. Like, how would you find a good contractor? Um, you know, you've just got to go through and try and it, is educate yourself as much as possible, get as much information and make an educated decision. Um, it's troubling how many times there are uh, IT providers out there that are trying to get with the, the new trend in the, of security. And they say, we now offer security services and IT services, so you don't need to go anywhere else. And mm -hmm. these are the companies that are, are coming to us. I just got an email uh, yesterday from a company that saw our uh, COVID-19 IOC tracker database. And they said, this is cool, but uh, a customer told me that you guys launched this, but how do I use this? And I go to their website to see who they were and their, their homepage says, you know, manage security for businesses. Like if they don't know what a basic, like how to block an IP address or an email address, how are they offering security services? So, you know, not just looking at their website and say, cool, they offer security services, we're good to go. Um, I think we've seen uh, in the, the mortgage space, we've seen, someone's going to correct me here, but I think about 20, 21 ransomware cases uh, just in the last year, um, at least two of those were with an IT company that was in the, um, the lender's um, environment. So it was basically, they were have remote control, remote access to the company. And mm -hmm. the bad guys saw that. And so they took over the entire IT company's remote access tool and breached all of their customers. And they installed awesome. ransomware. They pushed it out to everyone else. So their IT uh, company was the way that they got compromised with ransomware. So it's well, that's embarrassing. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> I went to the that IT company's website, and they had a blog that talked about how to prevent against ransomware. And I thought that was pretty ironic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, okay, so is there anything else we should be aware of, like just in general? Because it sounds like it's a mix of both IT, but also kind of social engineering, just being smart outside of the computer. Yeah. So I think everyone sees like Mr. Robot or, you know, these things in the news of how there's this sophisticated hack where someone rappelled down from a skylight and bypassed all the security and all that stuff is really cool. But most of the, the stuff that we see, the way the bad guys get in, the um, the way systems get infected, ransomware gets distributed. A lot of these things are just human errors, right? There's a lot of security tools out there. Microsoft has built an antivirus. They provide updates. It's a lot of the times the, the root cause of the incident that we see was really just some made a mistake. They weren't doing updates to their computers. They were, they let the license lapse for their antivirus. They, their users clicked on emails that they didn't, um, they weren't paying attention to little things that people make mistakes. So um, I think more than ever, when we've got this, this pandemic, everyone's freaking out, we're more susceptible because we've got maybe a kid that's, that's right next to us, or we're cooking dinner while working and we're doing multiple things. And so we really need to think about um, with email and links and those kind of things, we just have to slow down for a second, double check it and not just make any rash decisions on clicking, opening, installing those kind of things. I think that's probably the biggest thing that most of us can do um, during this work for work from home period. That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for all of this. How can people get a hold of you? Sure. Uh, they can check out our website, richiemaytech.com, or they can reach out to us, info at richiemay.com. Well, thank you so much for this. Uh, if you need anything, of course, I'm here for you. And I appreciate you answering all these questions. Thanks, Rick. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.